Greetings from Asheville, North Carolina. Another nice spring day. The class that we're going to look at today, Class X, deals with Einstein and general relativity. The very famous precession of the perihelion of Mercury, the 43 arc seconds per century that could not be explained with regular gravity in the solar system. It was known for some time that Mercury did something strange in its orbit. It processed or the orbit shifted like a rotation, tracing out a flower, a poinsettia, and most of it could be explained by regular Newtonian gravity, but there was an excess of 43 arc seconds per century. What a small amount. Now, normally this topic is very advanced. One has to uh, solve the uh, Einstein field equations of general relativity. And the traditional approach has been to use tensor analysis. And this can take a lot of time, but there is a way we can do it. A little bit of hand waving at one place and a fine paper that was published in the American Journal of Physics that uses a trick. Uh, now the uh, tough part about this is going to be some algebra to understand the elliptical orbit in polar coordinates, but that's high school algebra, so uh, we can survive that. So I hope you enjoy this uh, very, very uh, famous result, the 43 arc seconds per century that Einstein predicted from the general theory of relativity, and we're going to do it for you in this class. Class X. Einstein and the precession of the perihelion. Einstein and the precession of the perihelion. Section one, the gravitational effect on time. So here we have a celestial body. We'll be looking at the sun as the, the body. And let's look at a distance from the center of the sun. And we're going to look at here uh, conservation of energy. So if we consider the energy of light, we'll have HF, remember for the photon, the energy is HF, which also can be written as mc squared, where m is some effective mass for the photon. So here we have the energy, and then we have the potential energy, which is a negative. So for this point here in consideration, as a photon is passing by, at this point we'll have energy HF, and then the potential energy added to that. Remember your potential energy is minus big G M, m over r you consider this to be the little m and the big m down there so here we're going to compare at infinity so this would be the photon at infinity and at infinity there is no potential energy as the reference and then if you imagine that a photon coming from infinity toward the sun, then at the distance r, we would have this energy. So this is at infinity. And here for the mass, we're going to be using E divided by C squared. 
to get the effective mass, and the E is H F. So we have that formula. So we can come down here and write H, the Planck constant, times the frequency at infinity is equal to the Planck constant times the frequency at the distance R from the center of the sun minus GM over R and then the HF over C squared for the effective mass. Now I need to emphasize that this is a semi-classical derivation since this is classical and in general relativity we wouldn't be using that but what's fascinating is that we're going to be arriving at some exact solutions that apply in general relativity even though our method is not rigorously general relativistic all the way so here we're going to take the frequency at infinity we're going to factor out here the f on the right side and have one minus g big M over c squared r. And remember that the way the period goes, it's reciprocal when you look at the frequency. F is 1 over t, t is 1 over f. So I can then write t is t infinity, 1 minus g M c squared r. And then what we're saying here is that at this point, we're going to call the uh, time at infinity t and then t prime the distorted time that's near the uh, sun because of the sun's gravity. This is 1 minus gm c squared over r and then dt. So just as a reminder, this is at r is equal to infinity a clock that doesn't have any gravity uh, affecting it. You can think of it like a, the special relativistic uh, situation uh, where there is no gravity. And here uh, we find that this is actually the exact general relativistic result right here. It's amazing. All right, now let's look at the effect the gravitational, gravitational effect on space, since that was time. And since I'm going to include the time with the space, as is the practice, of course, in relativity, these are combined, we'll say space-time, but we'll focus on, on the space. You might recall from special relativity earlier in our course that we had Lorentz contraction, 1 minus v squared over c squared. So if a rod was in a moving frame and we were watching it from uh, the laboratory frame, that we would find a contraction. So this is Lorentz contraction. L naught is in the moving frame. And then if we observe from the lab, a moving frame with a clock in it where T naught is the proper time, the watch that's being carried by the person in the moving frame, then this represents a time stretch or a time dilation. Now, if we look at this and compare to uh, the uh, formula up here, which I have with involving time, Notice that space has the same square root factor as the time, but it's flipped. In other words, here it's in the numerator and here it's in the denominator. Now I'm going to use that as an inspiration to uh, say that it is suggesting that the distortion in the space would be given by a reciprocal relation in a similar similar way. So I'm taking one over that. Since 
the dt prime is equal to this distortion factor times dt, where dt is the good time at infinity, the undistorted time. I'm saying here the distorted space is given by undistorted space divided by the same factor. Now that's not rigorous, that's being suggested, but we're gonna get the exact result by following this line of thought. Now, if you recall earlier in our course, the line element in special relativity was given by this nice result, where space and time are treated on an equal footing. And the C makes the time variable have the correct dimensions as x, y, and z. If we look at this relationship in spherical coordinates, we would then replace the Cartesian version with dr squared minus dr squared d theta squared and then minus r squared sine squared theta d phi squared. So what we're saying here for the general relativistic case, so this is special relativity, if we look at general relativity, and let's focus on the space-time here since uh, these others would be fine. We're not gonna need to change those, but here is where we're gonna have something that's different. ds squared would be then one minus the GM over C squared R, and we would have be squaring that. That's coming from up here. We're squaring all this, and we need to stick a C squared in there. C squared DT squared, and then minus the DR squared case, where we're just going to write the denominator squared here. And the next step, we're working with the solar system, and in the solar system, we have weak gravitational effects. So this is gonna be uh, very much less than one. Uh, the speed of light is such a large uh, value that, and, and this G uh, is, is a very small value, and this mass of the sun is large, but if you were to plug these in, you would find that this is satisfied. In general relativity, when you look at the, at the sun and the solar system, we're so far away from black holes in terms of you know, strength of gravitational field that this case is gonna be the, the situation. So that means we can have ds squared by doing uh, the Taylor, Taylor series expansion trick. So if you have like one here uh, minus some small quantity squared, that's one minus, uh, you're gonna have here, you're gonna have the two uh, in the front there. Now remember in general, we had one plus epsilon to the nth power, and we said that's one plus n epsilon. So that's so often used in physics. Uh, here you have a square, a, a two, so, and you have a minus sign. So this would be then one uh, minus, right, minus two gm over c squared r. And that would then be hitting the c squared dt squared. And then the second one here, what we'll do is uh, the same thing in the denominator. This will be a one minus two GM. For now, we'll just leave it there. We could um, consider that as a, and as a minus sign, minus two, but for now, let's just keep it simple like that. And then we'll have the angular parts will be fine. So we write those down. And this result is amazing. It is the exact general relativistic line element. This, this is exact. This is, this is general relativity exact. Exact.
result. This is the S squared. Fascinating. That's called the line, the line element. Uh, here's another exact result that's obtained by semi-classical, or actually in this case, purely classical means. And it was discovered way back by an English country par parson, Mitchell, 1795. This is amazing. I was fascinated when I was first taught this. And I realized that it's not as well known as it should be. So I wrote a paper in The Physics Teacher where I gave the derivation and also related it to the work of Andrea Ghez, who does work with the galaxy, Milky Way galaxy, and measures the uh, amount of mass that's in this black hole in the center of our galaxy. Very, very fascinating research. Well, here's the idea of Mitchell. Go way back, or Michel, if you go back uh, very, very far in, in time here, uh, it's a very, very simple concept that if you have an escape velocity problem, and suppose the escape velocity is the speed of light, then you wouldn't be able to uh, have the light escape, and therefore you would have a black hole. All right, this is way before general relativity. So if we do this, we have the uh, kinetic energy, one half mv squared. Say we're gonna give this a kick, kicking this thing off, and then we're gonna add the potential energy. And since we're at the surface of the a celestial body, it'll be a, the radius of that body. And then when you get to infinity, uh, the, the mass, if you're kicking the mass off, it's gonna just come to rest. Uh, you just want enough energy just to get it uh, free to escape the celestial body. So there'll be no kinetic energy. And at infinity, if, if you use the uh, formula, gm, m over r, since r is at infinity, you would have no potential energy there as the reference. And we're going to let the V be the speed of light. So we'll have one half C squared here is going to be equal. Uh, we'll bring this on the other side. Notice that the masses here are going to cancel out. This will equal G big M over R. And this gives us a condition of the radius and how compact the mass needs to be. If you bring the radius over to the left and bring the two over here, you have the two times the GM and then you bring the C squared there. And this is the exact result that comes from general relativity. This is called the Schwarzschild radius. And in the Schwarzschild radius, if you get the, the mass packed down to that small uh, radius, inside that small radius and corresponding diameter, then you will get a black hole. Uh, the forces go wild and you get your strength down to, uh, in classical general relativity, it's called the singularity. So if you are to put in uh, here, you know, your G, uh, this is your 6.67 times 10 to the minus 11, and that would be Newton here and meters squared to get your units right over kilogram squared. And the mass of the sun, there's a symbol for the sun there, a little circle to dot, 1.989 times 10 to the 30th, uh, kilograms, and then the speed of light, uh, 3.00 times 10 to the eighth. You know, this is actually very close to 3.00. And if you plug these in, uh, you will get then the radius to be about th it's three kilometers. And you say, no way, there's no way you can pack the sun like a snowball into three kilometers, that's impossible, that's never gonna happen. Well, actually in astrophysics, this can happen, not with the sun, but with stars that are larger than the sun. What can happen, uh, well, well, what will happen actually, the way stars die, the sun will die as a white dwarf, but uh, the heavier stars 
will undergo supernova explosion. And with the supernova explosion, you'll be compressing mass on the inside and blowing the daylights out of mass on the outer part of the star. And that is a mechanism to compress things down to this radius and get the black hole. And then the black hole can uh, eat up other mass and get bigger and bigger. And the work of Andre Agues, which is very fascinating, uh, is that the center of our galaxy has a black hole of uh, about four million solar masses. I remember being in graduate school where Charles Misner uh, of the Wheeler Misner Thorn fame, Kip Thorn fame of the uh, gravitation book. When that book came out, I was in grad school and I was in uh, Misner's class and Misner actually gave a seminar around this time where he uh, talked about he talked about the black, a black hole, possible black hole in the center of the uh, galaxy. Actually, that was before I took his class. That was when I was still uh, in college. So you drove from New Jersey down to Maryland to uh, check some things out. And he gave that talk. And look, years later here, we find uh, research uh, measuring that. So here you got, you got two uh, mistakes that canceled. This is the wrong kinetic energy from the point of view of general relativity. This is the wrong potential energy. And sometimes two mistakes cancel, you get the right answer. And this is the answer you get if you take Einstein's field equations and solve them, and you get this result, the Schwarzschild radius. Fascinating. Another way to get an exact result by lucking out. So now we're gonna to go to Kepler's three rules, or three laws, and these are empirical laws discovered by uh, Kepler using data. Tycho Brahe and Kepler, working with data. Tycho Brahe, the great astronomer that collected data over many, many decades. And the mathematician, Kepler, coming up with three laws, which can be arrived at by Newton later, but at the time, they're empirical laws. And the first, the first law is considered the law of ellipses. We need this if we're going to be talking about Mercury's orbit around the sun. Well, it starts out as, as an ellipse. And the precession means the ellipse is going to turn. It's going to, it's going to like rotate gently over the centuries. So let's look at the ellipse here. This is before general relativity. And that is, the rule is that planets uh, travel around the sun along ellipses where the sun is at a focus. Now, with an ellipse, you have two, two foci. You have two places. Let's go ahead and look at the ellipse, the mathematical equation. Uh, often, uh, one encounters this in high school. All right, it's a nice, uh, nice uh, equation. Uh, this is your x, this is uh, your y, and this point at the top here, at x equals zero, the white, uh, the y has the has the b distance, which is called semi minor axis, and here's the major axis, and if you go here, major axis, uh, that's we're going to call that two a, and that would be the point here, C would be A at Y equals zero. And over at this point, you'd have a minus A and Y equals zero. And then this uh, nice uh, equation that goes with that is your X uh, squared over A squared uh, plus Y squared over B squared is equal to one. So here, if the y equals zero, you have then x squared is going to be a squared, which is x would be plus or minus a, which you get here, see when y is zero. And then if x is zero, then this goes away, and you have the y is going to be plus or minus b. And that's going to give you the plus or minus b down, down in this point here. This would be your uh, x is zero, and the y is minus b. 
All right, and the minor axis uh, would be this distance here, which is 2b. That's why they say semi, semi meaning one half. The semi major axis is a, and b would be the semi minor axis. Now, another way of looking at the ellipses with the two focal points. So it's the focal point, say, here and focal point there. And the way you can understand these focal points, when I taught astronomy in a non-mathematical way, we had some fun by taking thumbtacks and putting two thumbtacks into a cork board with a piece of paper and then having string. And with the string here, if we uh, took a pen and whipped around with the string, we would get an ellipse. In other words, you have this string here and you just go around like that and you get yourself an ellipse. And this is a distance F, we'll call a little f, uh, the, the focal distance, and there's two of them. So the sun would be at one of these. You throw the other one away, we don't need it. And then the planet would go along, along the ellipse. Now here we use string that had three parts, this part, this part, and this part. But since this part there is constant uh, and fixed, we can look at, at these two as being the string. Uh, and notice that that's, the sum is going to be constant. So if I have a point P here and say this is focal point uh, 1 and this is focal point 2, then if we were to go from, say, focal point 1 to P and go from P to focal point 2, uh, what would that be? What would that be? Well, if you if you were to bring this point P down to the bottom here, or the middle here, then this string would go all the way there and then back up some, all right? But if it went all the way there and backed up some, it's doubled up here, but if I take that piece and put it over here, then this is gonna be uh, two times the semi-major axis. In other words, the string length is going to be equal to uh, 2a. So when we're, when we're way, say, over at this point, when the string is like way over there, then if you just take this little piece of string and put it over on the other side, then you can see that that string is 2a. All right? So given that, that's nice to know. And then another definition is the distance to the focal point, that F, is given by definition the eccentricity times A. See, if, if these points are at the center, you would then have a circle. So if epsilon equals zero and then you're at the, at the, at the center, you got a circle. And then the epsilon gives you a measure of how elongated the ellipse is. So let's now look at another nice relationship. And the nice relationship is to consider the ellipse again and the focal points and draw this kind of a triangle on either side. Here, B is the height, F is there. The B is the height, but guess what? This sum, remember, if we go from here F1 to P and P to F2, we know that's 2A. That means since these are the same, this is A and this is A. Now, this is a very, very nice relationship because now we have a triangle where we have parameters that are very important for the ellipse. We have the semi-minor axis. We have the semi-major axis now as the hypotenuse and F, the focal length, as the base of the triangle. So now with Pythagor the Pythagorean theorem, A squared is B squared plus F squared. But since F is epsilon A, this is B squared plus epsilon squared, A squared. And it's really nice to have epsilon in terms of A and B. And that's what we're going to do here. If we we look at this uh, relationship, the a squared here is going to be equal uh, to this combination over on the right. 
So that means if I take a squared and subtract b squared, I get epsilon squared a squared, and that means the epsilon squared is a squared minus b squared over a squared, and that's one minus b squared over a squared. You're gonna see that most of the mathematics for this class is actually gonna involve high school math, high school algebra, the ellipse, because we're gonna to wanna to go to polar coordinates and that's gonna be another, another mess of algebra, but it's high school algebra. So in that sense, it's, it's very straightforward what we'll be doing. So this formula uh, is the relationship between the uh, a, b, and, and the epsilon. And if you want, you can write it as uh, the square root of one minus b squared over a squared. And you can see that if a equals b, if a equals b, that's when we have a circle. And if a equals b, you get the one minus one, zero. So epsilon, when epsilon here, the uh, centricity is equal to zero, that's when a equals b, and we're talking circle. Now, if the b is, uh, let's say uh, here, if we have the b is, say, being small, all right? So in other words here, if b is small, then we get more like a cigar, all right? See, if this is, if, if b gets smaller, we're like squishing this thing. So for b uh, getting uh, small, then the eccentricity is gonna approach one. Now, if it hits one, you have a different conic section. Uh, th these are nice um, uh, to relate these to conic sections. If you have a cone, if you slice it here, you get a circle. If you slice it like that, you get an ellipse. And if you slice it, uh, you can get hyperbola and parabola. And those conic sections are usually taught in high school. Uh, we are interested here in the ellipse, so we won't worry about the others. Uh, but when you solve Newton's uh, equations, you find that when you have the gravitational problem, the Kepler problem, that the solutions are to conic sections. You can have uh, planets going around the sun as ellipses. In fact, we said that was the law, but you could have the the circle case, which is an ellipse that has the eccentricity equal to zero. It's a circle, so you could have that case. And then the two other states are, are the free states, where something can come in like this, they have a parabola, or you could have the hyperbola. Uh, these are very, very nice, the four conic sections. These two are uh, scattering states. You can think of comets coming in that never come back. Of course, you could have a comet that does come back, like Halley's Comet. And these are the bound states. All right, so we're not finished yet. We have a lot more to do uh, before we can get to general relativity, and that is looking at the ellipse in polar coordinates where we put the sun at a focal point, and then the ellipse, say, is like, is like this. So we have taken the center of the ellipse that we had before and shoved it to the right by the distance of the focal the focal length. So that's what we did uh, before we had, you know, we had the ellipse in this form, had the focal point there, focal point there, this is F. And if you take this uh, graph, this curve and shove it to the right by this F, then this F becomes now on that nice uh, uh, origin. And that's what we want for analyzing the sun. So uh, here, uh, we're doing two things. One, we are doing the shift. We're going to shift. We're going to shift the ellipse so that the sun is going to be at zero zero. All right. So here is here we are at zero zero zero. Uh, the crosshairs, and then two, we want to go to polar coordinates. Now, to do these two steps, the first step we're going to do is do the shift. To do the shift, we take the equation we had before, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. And then if we shift, remember if we shift the function uh, to the right, then x becomes x minus 
whatever that shift is. In this case, it's going to be F. And F is the eccentricity times A. So therefore, we're going to have X minus A times eccentricity, that squared over A squared, plus Y squared over B squared equals 1. That's part one. Now, part two, we need to go to polar coordinates. Well, to do that, we use the famous equations. X is little r cosine theta. See, so we want we want to have, say, an r and a theta. That's what we want here for polar coordinates with respect to that origin. Your distance directly to the point on the orbit is r, and the angle measured from uh, the x-axis here is going to be your is going to be your uh, angle at theta. So here we have then r uh, times sine of theta to get you the y, and then we plug in and much much algebra is ahead. But remember, it's high school algebra, and that's can be can be nasty, but at least conceptually. It's uh, straightforward, all right, in that point of view. So I have here the, this equation. I'm going to have r cosine theta minus a times eccentricity, and that's going to be squared, and then divide that by a squared. And we're going to add uh, to that uh, here the y, the y case, which is going to be, uh, this is going to be your uh, r uh, sine. Your r sine of theta is going to go in for the y. All right. And that's going to be one. All right. So it's time to start doing some algebra here. And we'll have uh, r squared cosine squared uh, theta over a squared. And then minus, cross term, there'll be 2a uh, epsilon r cosine theta over a squared. And then plus a squared epsilon squared over a squared. Then plus r squared sine squared theta over b squared equals 1. All right. And then the next step we're going to do is collect terms a little bit. So let's let's go here and let's say we're going to divide uh, by r squared. Let's divide by r squared. And the reason why we do that is that it has been found in the past that to have 1 over r in other words, to have the variable u as 1 over r is easier to work with. So we're preparing ourselves for that variable change by dividing by r squared. So if we do that, we get cosine squared theta over a squared. And let's put the uh, sine over here with the cosine 1. Too bad that's b squared, not a squared. But we'll, we'll see how we can get this simplified after some steps. And then we have here minus, and A will cancel here. We'll have two epsilon. If you divide by R squared, all right, that'll leave the cosine alone. But you'll have down in the bottom, you'll have here an R and an A. So an A squared becomes an A because of a cancellation. And then you're dividing by R squared. So then you wind up with the R because there was an R numerator. And then the last thing here would be this epsilon squared, uh, a's cancel, and we'll go ahead and subtract uh, the one. And then since we're dividing by r squared, we have to do that, and then we have zero. All right, and the next step is to uh, replace the one over r with the u, and that would mean we got a quadratic equation here, and this is gonna be the leading uh, the leading term, and that's going to be, I'm going to say for this one, I would like to multiply 
by a minus one because this epsilon squared, that's going to be your essence history. That goes from, that goes from zero to one, you know, and I don't want, I want to have that, that's, that's less than one. I want the bigger one first. So I'm going to have one minus epsilon squared, all right, like that. So I know this is a positive quantity times u squared. And that means we're going to switch the sign of this, uh, the cross term. Uh, I'm going to put that one down next because one over R is U, that's two epsilon cosine theta over A, and then the one over R is the U. And then this is our constant term in our quadratic equation. This doesn't have any U involved. So uh, remember I multiply by a minus, so I have to put a minus sign here, and that's gonna be cosine squared theta over A squared plus sine squared theta over b squared. Now, could we have skipped all these steps and just give you the result and say, you learned this in high school? No, we can't do that because we're theoretical physicists. Derive everything. That's the motto. You do derive everything yourself. You don't, don't even trust the integral tables. You don't even trust it. This, this is the, the goal, is to do this as much as possible. So I, I, in the spirit of that philosophy, I'm showing you everything, all right? So now we have uh, the quadratic equation, and the quadratic equation here, say a times u squared plus bu. And yes, I have derived the quadratic equation uh, in in the past. Uh, so that's uh, something that everyone should do at least once in their life, and then memorize the result. And the result is. Uh, minus b. I'm using uppercases here because uh, little b and little a have already been used. Plus or minus the square root uh, b squared minus 4ac. Uh, Feynman also said that uh, experimentally, the same thing applies. Uh, he said that there's one school that had a big uh, like accelerator of nuclear uh, phys for nuclear physics, but then the other school. Uh, at Princeton, the one he was at, they 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 had all these things hanging down in the basement, and they basically had everything. They were doing everything, everything from scratch, and they understood the physics, the physics uh, more. So it's, it's the same uh, counterpart, say in experimental work, where if if you can avoid the black black box effect and and get into the nitty gritty of things, that can give you uh, much insight. And of course, you have to know when. Uh, to use the black box because sometimes uh, that is the way to go. All right, so here we have then uh, minus uh, two epsilon cosine theta over a plus or minus, and you say, oh no, no, this is way really messy. All right, it is. All right, so the b squared is going to be the four, and this is going to be your epsilon squared cosine squared theta uh, over a squared. And now comes the minus 4ac, minus 4. Uh, the a is the 1 minus epsilon squared. All right. And then the uh, c over here well, has a minus sign, a minus 1. And then you have cosine squared theta over a squared plus sine squared theta over b squared, all right, and there, there we go, all right, not finished, uh, what about this, you gotta divide all this mess with 2a, which is 2 times 1 minus epsilon squared, and see, theoretical physicists love paper like this, in fact, uh, we used to use old computer paper that was large like this in the old days, uh, to do our theoretical work on, and fill pages and pages and pages with calculations, uh, for our thesis. Um, all right, so let's work first of all with the square root thing. So what's underneath all this stuff? Well, we have here four epsilon squared cosine squared theta over a squared. And now here, this is gonna be a plus sign because the two minus signs cancel, plus four and one minus epsilon squared. And then we're gonna have the cosine squared theta over a squared plus the sine squared theta over b squared. All right. Now, the next step uh, we're gonna do is work out, work this out. So we have the first term, we'll leave it for now in there. 
And then here we have then four times the cosine squared term, all right? And we'll do bring the four in, distribute that in there and get the sign while we're at it. And then comes the minus signs. So then the minus four epsilon squared with the cosine squared. And then there'll be the minus four epsilon squared uh, with the sine squared like that. And now we see we get some cancellation. I get a cancellation. This one and this one are gone. All right. So that brings us down to four cosine squared over a squared. And we have uh, here plus the four uh, sine squared over b squared. And now I want to get rid of that epsilon. So that epsilon, remember, is 1 minus, if you square, it's 1 minus b squared over a squared. That's good. All right. So it's the sine uh, squared one that I need to worry about. That baby's gone. All right. I'm glad, glad to see that since that's less to write down. And then we have here 4 cosine squared theta over a squared plus 4 sine squared theta over b squared. And then there's a minus 4 sine squared theta over b squared. Oh, that's nice. And then there's a plus. Notice the b squared cancels. They get 4 sine squared over a squared. That's even nicer because that will combine with that first one and give me 4 over a squared since cosine squared plus sine squared is equal to 1. All right. Very nice. Very nice simplifications going on here. So what do we have? We go back uh, to where we, uh, well, I guess way back up in here. We have minus two epsilon times the uh, cosine of theta over A, all right? That's from up here. And then plus or minus uh, that square root uh, is gonna be over this four A squared. And then the whole thing, is over the two, one minus epsilon squared. All right, now here, we're gonna have minus two epsilon cosine theta over A, plus or minus two, plus or minus two over A, right? Because that, that four, square root of four is two, and square A squared is gonna give you that, and that's over the two, one minus epsilon squared. And notice here that a two, a two is gonna go out. This two is gonna go out with that two and this two. So if we get rid of all that, we're gonna have a minus epsilon, uh, epsilon here, the uh, eccentricity. Uh, and there's gonna be here a cosine that's gonna be hitting that. And then uh, uh, here, let's see, this, this two, uh, that was down here. Let's see, we got uh, that two cancels, and then we have plus or minus. If the two cancels, we have plus or minus one. And then what are we doing about that A? Well, let's stick that A back down to the denominator where it belongs, is down in here. All right, one minus epsilon squared. Okay, now this is the solution for the U. And the U is one over R. First thing right off, which solution are we gonna use, plus or minus, or both? Well, here, u is 1 over r. r is positive. It's the distance from the sun to the planet. Now, if this is negative here, well, we can't have another negative. That would, that would ensure negativity. So we've got to take the plus sign solution. So if we take the plus sign solution, then 1 over r is going to be 1 minus epsilon cosine theta over a 1 minus epsilon squared. And if we want to get this in the form uh, where we have R, then what we're going to do is flip it. So then R is going to be equal to A, 1 minus epsilon squared over 1 minus epsilon cosine theta. So this is the final result, which in the spirit of theoretical physics, we show all the steps. Um, we derived it. Now let's look at that for a second and uh, see if it kind of makes sense. Like if you have R at zero degrees, 
then we're going to be, let's say we get ourselves, whoops here, we're gonna be over here. And what is that gonna give us? Well, we're gonna have here uh, A, one minus epsilon squared over one minus epsilon cosine of zero is one. So that's what you're gonna get. And that would be a cancellation since this uh, is gonna be one plus epsilon times one minus epsilon. The one minus epsilon will cancel. This will be A one plus epsilon, which is A plus A epsilon, which is your focal uh, length. So if you look at this, uh, there is your A, semi major axis, and then this is your focal length over here. So that's correct. That's what we want. And then if we were to look at uh, the other extreme, say where uh, you're looking at 180 degrees, then in that case, the cosine is going to be negative uh, uh, one. So you'll have a one minus epsilon squared over one uh, plus epsilon. So then when you do that uh, trick, this is going to be a, uh, it's going to be one uh, minus epsilon uh, will will sh will will show up uh, because this is has one of each a plus and a minus and you're going to cancel a plus one so you get this and if you look at that that's a minus the focal the focal length so if you're on this side uh, then this is your a to get all the way to the edge and then minus the focal length uh, see minus focal length there is going to get you uh, a yeah, because see here, well, see, actually, that's not the way to look at it. We're, we we have to go back now to the to putting the uh, you got to put the uh, focal point here at the at the origin. See here. So in this case, uh, when you look at this distance here, all right, we had this is your f. So this is your a all the way to the end, and minus minus the f. This is your a minus f, which is what you want. A little bit tricky because you got to go back and forth from the different. Uh, um, graphs. Okay, so now we're ready to uh, go to the second law. Before that, let's just write down on this new piece of paper, law one, the ellipse rule. So we have a one minus epsilon squared over here, one minus epsilon close sine theta. Uh, the second law, uh, the second law of Kepler is the law of areas. And for the law of areas, if we look at an ellipse, and here, if we look at, say, the planet going from one place to another, and then farther away doing it, uh, let's look at Halley's Comet. Say Halley's Comet came in 1986, and whipped around the sun, here's Halley's Comet, in one academic year, 85, 86. But then, when you go over here, one academic year, it, it doesn't uh, travel, let's say, as, as much that way, because see the area here, the piece of pie, would be the same as that piece of pie. So, because you have that large, larger distance, that the area is obtained by a smaller piece there. So it spends most of its time, of the 76 years or so, out far away. And then when it comes in, it whips, whips by in one academic year. So here, if we look at this uh, equal areas and equal times, that's, what, that's how you could say this, that the planet, the planet sweeps out equal areas in equal times. So one way to look at that is to say, well, what is the area? Here we will approximate this strip as with the right angle, and this is the base R. We'll use capital R here uh, for the uh, for the distance from the uh, sun to the to the planet, and this is then R uh, d d theta. All right, say d theta, and then your area, piece of area here, d a, is uh, one half the base times the uh, altitude, r d theta, as area of a triangle. And that can then be written as 
a derivative at respect to time, you know, dA dt, is then one half r squared d theta dt. And Kepler's second law says that's constant. That's a constant. So there's the second law, and the first law has a nice equation there. And this result is true for all uh, forces that are radial. So if the uh, planetary force between, say, the sun and the planet was some other power of R, this, this law will still be true. You wouldn't get the ellipses, though. So if you have a, for a central force, uh, force as a function of uh, R, then this is going to uh, be true. Uh, that's unlike law one and law three, which depend on inverse square law. So the third law, uh, which is the law of periods, uh, states that the cube of the semi-major axis is proportional to the square of the period. I cannot resist uh, deriving this for you as they do in elementary physics courses for a circular orbit. So for a circular orbit, A equals B equals R. And if we use F equals MA, we have the forces GM, M. This is the uh, Newton's gravity. And that's equal to mass times acceleration, which for a circle is V squared over R. And this would be M over R. And the uh, velocity is the circumference divided by the period would be the uh, the sir, uh, conference by that period, period capital T, would get you your speed. So this is saying that G big M over R squared is equal to, see these, these M's are gonna cancel, four pi squared, big R squared over T squared. And if you bring the T to the left-hand side and that R squared to the right-hand side, you can see that you're getting the result. There's the R cubed, there's the T squared. Uh, so R cubed is equal to big G, big M over pi, four pi squared times T squared. This is the result of Kepler's third law. Law three. And now we're ready to do the precession of the perihelion. Now that we have all this basic stuff. So that's four, the precession of the perihelion. And we're gonna be doing Mercury. Since Mercury is the closest planet to the sun, it has the most pronounced effect. So here you have your ellipse, but in general relativity, there's precession and you are uh, tracing out uh, like a point set, like a flower, like this. And one says that this closest approach to the, uh, the closest distance to the sun, which is your uh, perihelion, that the perihelion is uh, shifting, but really the whole, the whole thing is shifting. But that's what they call it. They call it the shift of the perihelion. So here, uh, when we looked at uh, this equation here, we, uh, I wanna show you uh, how you can get this by an integral, which is gonna be important because uh, you gotta be careful with general relativity because of all the distortion in, in the R and the uh, radial uh, component. So here, when you have this a kind of a situation of a triangle and you wanted to get this area, you could set this up as, say, doing an R uh, times, uh, say, say an R times d theta times a dr. In other words, in the polar coordinates, uh, a little, a little element, a little element that you're going to integrate over, all right? So uh, here you're going to integrate from zero to big R, all right? And then we'll just leave the d theta, the d theta part uh, alone. All right, so if we do this, and you say, well, this is easy to do because that's going to be simply from zero to big R, R dr, and then a d theta. And this is going to be then R squared over two from zero to big R, and that's big R squared over two. 
and that's what we had. So you, uh, we had big R square over two, and then you had the d theta, and then you had d theta dt. But we had to be careful because of the distortion uh, that we have in, in general relativity. So in ge general relativity, we have distortion in space and distortion in time. So we had this result earlier, and then we had here the distortion in the space. All right. And after we get that done, I just wanted to remind you that there's no problem with the other parts, the minus r squared d theta squared, uh, minus the r squared sine squared theta d phi squared. All right, but here's your distortion, big time. So this is distortion in the time, and this is distortion here in the space and the radial coordinate. So be very, very careful. And if I want to look at this now, dA prime in general relativity, I'm gonna integrate from zero to r, and I'm gonna have the distorted dr prime, because things are distorted there, and the normal r d theta uh, from over here, that part's fine. And then this uh, distorted part is going to be given uh, by uh, this here. Now this is actually squared, so I'm going to have to take the square root. This is going to be 1 minus 2 gm over c squared r to the minus 1 half power dr. So there's the undistorted uh, coordinate, like at infinity, that's what you would have uh, where the gravity is gone. But here we have the distortion. So this term is to the negative one half power and doing the Taylor series expansion trick, this is one uh, gonna be a plus because the minus is gonna come down uh, gm over c squared r dr, all right? Uh, using the old trick that one, you know, plus epsilon to the nth power is one plus n epsilon. So here n is negative one half and the epsilon just copy down that little, that, that small piece. So now we're ready to do uh, the integral. The uh, prime is going to be from zero to, to big R of this distortion, one plus uh, G M over C squared R, R dr d theta. Uh, just a quick uh, note, now this is coming from a beautiful paper by S. Uh, Kornbleet that was published in 1993 in the American Journal of Physics. Uh, beautiful, beautiful. Um, never thought you could get this result without general relativity formalism, and, and we're gonna do it here. We're, we're gonna get it uh, done. This is the exact uh, solution from general relativity, it's line element. So here, and this integral is very easy to do. Uh, this is basically uh, integrating here. This first one's gonna get you an R squared over two. And this next one's going to be a g m over c squared. The r's are going to cancel, but when you integrate, you're going to then pop an r back out. So see, this here is basically saying I'm going to integrate r plus g m over c squared. Uh, I'm, I'm going to integrate this with respect to r. So the first one's going to get me r squared over 2. The second one is going to just put the r back. And that's from 0 to big R. And then there's a d of theta hanging around. All right, so this is gonna give me the classical result, the big R square over two, but then uh, here uh, we got another result. Look at this from the distortion, all right? Okay, uh, the next step we're gonna do here is just do a little bit of factoring. We're gonna factor out uh, here the R squared over two. So then we'll have a one plus GM, and this will bring an R, and, a, and we'll have it, we'll actually have a two coming here. And then this will bring in a C squared and an R down in there. So if we look at this and go backwards, R squared over two gets you this first term. And then here, R squared over R gets you one R. And then the two cancels and we get that. So this brings us to then DA prime as R squared over two, one plus two, gm over c squared r, just copying this over again here, uh, d theta. Now, we need to have the time, but see, we have the distortion in time. This is beautiful. Now we have the distortion in time, the, the, the t, uh, dt prime. So uh, that's gonna give us r squared over two, one plus, 
the same here, and we're gonna have d theta d t prime, where that's the distortion time. What is that? Well, it's up here. See, this is, this here is c squared d t prime squared, this whole thing. So if I want to uh, look at, uh, say, d t prime, it's going to be taking the square root of this distortion factor, which was in the quadratic form because it had the dt squared uh, dt. So here, uh, c squared can go away because I'm just comparing the, the t's. And this is the dt prime without the c squared taking the square root. Uh, we're going to have this thing at a square root. So taking the square root, that would be a one uh, uh, here that's going to guess. Oh, before we do that, uh, we, can, we can do that now. I can, we can do it this way. I, ha I thought about it another way earlier, but let's just go ahead and do this. Uh, just keep uh, doing what we're doing. Uh, because I want one over, I want one over uh, the dt. I want this in the denominator. So if I do that, I'll have one over one minus gm over c squared t like this, d dt. And then here, uh, uh, this trick again, this is one plus gm c squared over r d d t. All right, so we're gonna put this thing up uh, in in here, and that'll get us the regular, see d theta d t, the distortion to be taken, flushed out and taken care of. So that means that the d a prime d t prime is r squared over two, we're almost finished, one plus two, uh, the gm over c squared r, and then one plus uh, gm c squared r uh, d theta dt, all right? And if we look at this and work this out, we're gonna have one plus, and then the cross terms, two and another, it's gonna be three, all right? And that's it, I'm not worried about the rest because the rest is gonna be higher order. In other words, it'll be the small uh, quantity squared. So I don't, I don't care for that. So if we now look at the uh, comparison, uh, classical, if we have classical, we have dA dt is one half r squared d theta dt. And if we look at then general relativity, we have dA prime dt prime, this is general relativity result, r squared over two, the one half, one plus three gm c squared r d theta dt. Uh, this is the term here, that second term that in there is gonna cause the pre precession. So in other words, there's an effective angle. It's as if uh, this uh, one plus three gm over c squared r, if I combine that with the, uh, the d theta like that, then that is an effective angle coming from the general relativity. Extra piece in there, uh, rather than just having the d theta. So what we have to do now uh, to, finish, to finish all this up is simply uh, find out what the change is if we go for one orbit. In other words, we go from zero to two pi, whip around to do one of the orbits. We'll have one plus three gm, over c squared r times d theta. Now we gotta be careful because this, this one over r, you see, this one over r, this, remember this r is equal to, all right, now this goes back to Kepler's uh, first law. That's gonna be uh, a one minus epsilon squared over one minus epsilon cosine theta. So if I want one over r, that's that, U that we define, we gotta we gotta flip this. So uh, let's go ahead and do that flip. Zero to two pi. We're gonna have here one plus three big GM over C squared. And now what is this one over R? Well, it'll be one minus epsilon cosine theta over a one minus epsilon squared. That's what that whole thing is. And then we're gonna integrate this uh, over that, over the angle. 
All right, now it looks a little complicated, but it's gonna simplify very nicely if we break it up into the three parts. So the first part is zero to two pi d theta. That's a classical result. You know, you go around one orbit, two pi. That's what you should get. Uh, what about this second one? Well, we get three gm here over c squared a one minus the uh, centricity squared. And that integral is very easy to do. You're gonna get two pi, but it's gonna be hitting with something. And the last one is a minus sign, gm over c squared. And we have an epsilon there. We have uh, a and a one minus epsilon squared uh, down in the uh, denominator. Uh, uh, but guess, guess what's happening here? Uh, this integral here uh, from uh, 0 to 2 pi is really the integral of the cosine theta. Uh, but that's easy. That's going to be the sine of theta. And guess what? At 0 and 2 pi, gone. At 2 pi, the sine of 2 pi is 0. The sine of 0 is zero. This is gone. So really, this is this is what we're left with. Uh, 2 pi, and this is, this is the formula. This is it. So you get then here uh, this delta... Uh, that's we're looking at delta theta for making one trip ar around the sun. Uh, you get the two pi uh, plus something else. Well, that's something else. Let's call that something else the variation or or the extra amount, the the extra de the delta, the, the delta. So that's going to be uh, two times three is six. Uh, there's going to be a pi in there. This is the wonderful formula. This is it. Gm divided by c squared. Uh, a, 1 minus epsilon squared, this is the shift of the perihelion. Now, they knew for centuries that uh, there was a lot of shifting going on at, at like 50, 500 or something arc seconds per century, but the 43 could not be explained uh, by regular gravity. See, the uh, uh, planets and doing things, making perturbations, they explained everything but 43. And when you uh, take this formula and... I real highly recommend you do, doing this yourself. Uh, the answer's in the book, uh, in my text. But actually plug in the numbers so that you get 43 arc seconds per century from this marvelous formula of Einstein, this derivation. Uh, very, very beautiful calculation. So, well, we did a lot of stuff here. Um, but we still made it within the time frame of my 75-minute class. Uh, but this is a long one. So I hope you enjoyed it and have fun uh, consulting the textbook uh, for the details and doing the numerical uh, plugging into the numbers.